Wait, this game has been out for over a decade. I feel old. Tell me your favorite Star Wars memory from childhood in the comments. Mine is this other game that should have been reskinned and whose servers should still be online today, but they're not. This is one of my longest videos also, so may I suggest, if you're not that interested in watching the whole thing, putting this on play in the background while you do something else, or you could put this on while you fall asleep. That really helps the watch time. So strap in, grab a mug of your favorite poison, grab some snack, get in a comfy position on your gamer chair, and dive with me into the world of Star Wars The Old Republic. Here are some important numbers. This game is estimated to have one of the most expensive developments in the history of video games. This game's budget is like that of a major A-list motion picture almost. At the very least, this game sunk 50 million into development, and some reports have the budget reach 200 million. With a budget like this, the cynic would perhaps expect another $40 million Mass Effect Andromeda. Bullet significantly dodged here, though. One million subscribers within three days of being live temporarily made this game the fastest growing ever, until it lost more than half of its subscribers in a few short years. In 2019, Tor was apparently close to accumulating $1 billion in total lifetime profits. It's no GTA V, but that is absolutely respectable and surprising considering the small current player base. You have to understand the hype and marketing behind this game though. For Star Wars fans, for people who actually played Star Wars Galaxies, this game promised to recapture your imagination. An MMORPG is usually the ultimate way to experience any IP, I think. It offers deep RPG elements with crafting profession systems and a multiplayer experience. It has a fully fleshed out massive world to explore. These are expectations an MMO must deliver on, and since Star Wars Galaxies was going offline permanently, Star Wars fans had high hopes for this game. Would you like to know more? Fond memories with games of any age don't have to stay memories. With a little help, of course. Smoke weed every day! I pre-ordered this game and consumed so much hype and info on YouTube before its launch that my balls were already empty before I had even played the game. My excitement could not be contained. That's what Star Wars does to me, and I'm not alone, obviously. By the way, Star Wars Galaxy servers were finally brought offline only four days before Tor released. However, that does not mean Sony Online Entertainment was passing the metaphorical torch to Bioware. The two games are fundamentally different, even though they share the same IP. Star Wars The Old Republic advertises their sort of linear story single player driven content front and center. The story and writing were deeply emphasized. Although you can progress through story quests with a group, that's usually not the case for the majority of players. Most individual players enter a private instance by themselves. That's for a cutscene or dialogue furthering the main plot slash questline. The devs made it very clear. That was the huge selling point for Star Wars The Old Republic. Quote, over a million lines of fully voice acted dialogue in the game at launch, they claimed. Star Wars Galaxies, on the other hand, had almost paper thin story and context since most of it is implied by the setting, which is during the original trilogy episodes four, five, and six. The emphasis in Star Wars Galaxies, I felt, was on multiplayer and the variety of professions and skills. Star Wars Galaxies also allowed for spontaneous world PvP, co-op player and multiplayer stuff in general. It's easy to draw comparisons between Tor and Star Wars Galaxies. Star Wars The Old Republic is not its spiritual successor though. Star Wars Galaxies was released in 2003. It wasn't able to be as flashy or good looking as Star Wars The Old Republic from 2011. In Star Wars Galaxies a lot of missions came from terminals. The objectives and enemies were usually the same formula kill a number of baddies, then kill their nest or hideout that spawned them. You had to level up things like terrain negotiation to increase your walking and run speed. These things may seem uninteresting and tedious, but 
it felt super rewarding, even when grinding. Star Wars Galaxies was complex and deep, and had many categories a player could improve in or level up. Sound familiar? <coughs> Instead of feeling tacky or tacked on, the things your character progressed in, improved in, were logical and made you feel so much more attached to your character. The socializing in Cantina's spontaneous world PvP, the raids to take over cities from the opposing faction, and the hunting raids to kill Rancors were all highlights from the Star Wars Galaxies experience. Star Wars Galaxies was an ambitious endeavor, especially with the expansion Jump to Lightspeed, which added another huge sandbox zone this time being in space. Jump to Lightspeed brought a space station to almost every planet. Space felt incredibly vast and endless, almost like in EVE Online or something similar. Having your own faction-specific or neutral starship with parts you crafted or bought from a crafter felt incredible and added even more sentimental value to your character. Now you could participate and aid your faction from the ground and from deep space. These ships were not mere mounts or reskins of mounts either. They had different crew capacities. You could visit a friend starship and vice versa. They had weapon and armor slots to upgrade and they had different speeds. The starships themselves felt like a second character or an extension of your character. Any game can go through a lot in 11 long years, although it doesn't feel like much has improved or even changed in Tor. There is pay to win and pay for convenience though. Side note, I love when games have tutorials or instructions on how to spend your real money in the game. Thank you game for instructing me on how to spend real money in your game after I spent real money to buy your game. Star Wars The Old Republic has always been the story-driven multiplayer RPG though. The story is voice acted very well and written very well. It's very compelling even to the casual Star Wars enjoyer. BioWare nailed both the voice acting and each class's main quest line. Star Wars The Old Republic has interesting and compelling quests with unique objectives. You are rarely, if ever, asked to gather, kill, or interact with something without a specific reason and more context added. Some of the quests have you dealing with relations between two or more parties. You will always hear both sides of the story. The choices you make always seem consequential, and it's usually more complex than just a choice between good or bad, between light and dark. That's really good writing. The worlds and zones feel alive thanks to the scale and the NPCs, but also the sound design and music are fantastic. There is enough content on each planet, especially when you complete the bonus objectives to kill a certain number of mobs and the bonus quest lines. Your senses are constantly reminded of the massive scale of this game. The sound design and music, like I said, is obviously fantastic. It's inspired by the brilliant John Williams. Some of the sound design and music is ripped straight from the movie, so that is a huge plus. Coruscant is a good example of how, despite being a planet of one trillion densely populated multi-species humanoids, the story and characters that interact with you still put you at the center of conflicts. It instills in you a feeling of affecting change in the galaxy. You feel you are making a difference and not just with the light side or dark side dialogue choices. That is classically great world building and Lucas would be proud. He was a genius at it. There is a problem though, having a huge scale environment and having lots of space means a lot of that space is wasted and empty. You spend solid minutes running to new areas that you haven't unlocked the fast travel or bike path for. Coruscant is one massive concrete and steel jungle sprawling the entire planet. A lot of the space is unused and could really use some more crafting, gathering nodes, more world bosses, more interactable stuff to do, for an example. That would make good use of more space. 11 years, and I guess no one thought the leveling experience warranted these things I mentioned, so nothing's going to change anytime soon. This game runs smooth 99% of the time, but there are some buggy issues. Occasionally, I will log in to one of my characters and through lag and dropped frames, the game became a slow stuttering mess. It became unplayable. Logging out then back in seemed to fix this. 
I don't know what issue causes this super slow performance in the first place, but at least it doesn't persist too long. Now, this game didn't even come close to dethroning Warcraft, the king of MMOs, but at least the character's hands actually grab the handlebars and steering wheels of mounts and vehicles. Sometimes you'll interact with an NPC who seems out of character, like the hut Barish, who really cares about saving children. Are we sure this hut wouldn't traffic or enslave these kids, just like the gang doing it already? It just seems out of character for a hut to care about saving children rather than credits or merchandise. The scenery in this game is, well, very dated and blurry. Planets like Nar Shaddaa remind me of Blade Runner in a way. A neon and hologram riddled horizon and spending just a few minutes here makes your eyes very tired. However, it is immersive enough and pretty cool. It's like if the tower from Destiny spanned an entire planet and if Destiny was made 10 years ago. I'm playing a smuggler, and man, the armor is lacking on it. Aesthetically speaking, it's dated, very odd, and makes me look like a gypsy from Neptune or something. The armor for my trooper character does look way better. It looks the part. He looks consistently like a clone from the clone army or alternate universe stormtrooper that instead fights for the rebellion. If you activate the side action bars, you get two extra bars on the right side of your screen. This ends up blocking the tooltip description for your abilities. I don't know if that's because of my resolution on my ultra-wide monitor or something missed by the devs, but it's a really annoying little bug. I can't read the tooltips. The character models are incredibly dated. When you stand still, you might as well be a statue as well. There are only three main body types that every human NPC has to pick from. These same body types are what players also pick from to create a character. The races other than human look okay, but overall they all look ugly and need some help. The humans look ugly too. I'm totally willing to look past this as well as other flaws with this game, but it needs to be said. If this game is the spiritual successor to Knights of the Old Republic, then it is Knights of the Old Republic 3. If this game is essentially KOTOR 3, the multiplayer aspect ruins immersion and cheapens everything the player does. With such single-player focused story content, having other players do the exact same thing as you is super awkward. Other players are conversing with the same NPCs, interacting with the same nodes, killing the same monsters as you. You can see how it could interfere with your immersion. This happens with every MMO. Every MMO has these problems. At least each class has its own exclusive quest areas and quest lines, so there is story and content unique to each class. It feels like since this game has adopted the freemium pay-to-win model, the experience gain has been increased and the pace at which you level up is way faster. Do the devs want you to just skip leveling now? Just from doing the quests presented to me and quests in the level appropriate zones, I am way over leveled for the current part of the story I am on. Are they trying to make leveling just a minor formality now? Is the whole point now to grind flashpoints? dungeons until you reach level cap, then experience endgame? Why would you shortchange the huge content and lore-rich storylines, all of which are completely voice acted so well? Don't sell that content short by treating it like a formality. The reason the leveling is happening so rapidly ahead of the story must be that the endgame involves the pay-to-win store. That would be bologna sandwiches. I am more than willing to level slowly, grind a few mobs in every zone, experience all the quest content and bonus objectives. This game is compelling enough for me to willingly dig through that content list I mentioned. Obtaining your first, second, or third, or whatever swoop speeder bike doesn't even compare to finally obtaining your first starship and entering space for the first time in said ship fully under your control. The smuggler ship well, it's more of a primitive looking Millennium Falcon. It's not lacking in style though. Inside, it's a comfy, cozy home away from your stronghold or player housing. The smuggler's light freighter ship even has a chess table to sit around. Your other crew member will tour you around the ship and show off the galaxy map, hollow terminal, cockpit, intercom, etc. I have played this game totally free to play so far. I am a founder though. I pre-ordered this game with a version better than the base or original game. I forget what came with my special version, 
some mounts, extra money or whatever, I do have a nice title of founder. That stuff is over a decade old now though. I do have the title of founder, which I said, which by itself is totally worth it. Nobody else has that title. I haven't seen a single person with that title yet. Would you like to know more? Player housing slash strongholds, they're really like a giant loft apartment or a giant estate. They are a great way to keep track of and show off your collections and status in the Old Republic. Based on how much decoration and thought you put into your stronghold is a prestige meter keeping track of all this. You compete with other players and guilds to increase your prestige. I'm super glad it's available to free players for in-game credits. Adding rooms and expanding your bachelor pad can also be done with in-game credits. Unfortunately, this is another opportunity to push the real money in-game purchases to pimp out your MTV crib. I just continue to ignore these advances like I do in every game. Honestly, the time I spent in Hutball as a trooper when the game first launched over a decade ago was super enjoyable. Hutball is one of the PvP games. Would you like to know more? Queuing for PvP 11 years later, I'm surprised the wait time isn't longer than one minute or so. That's a healthy thing for any game to have. Quick queues for PvP. Oh, new development. I suck at PvP in this game totally. Being away from it for 11 years, what do you expect? Especially the space dog fights. I'm glad both the PvP and the flying space flights are active, it's good to know but I won't be PvPing that often. At least you know it's active if you wanted that extra dimension to your Star Wars game. Would you like to know more? I've played a trooper and smuggler so far, and both of their combat play feels solid. It's kind of like any third-person shooter, actually. It almost feels like a button masher, meaning your rotation does not matter, but that's not technically true. Your rotation does matter in this game. You have to manage your respective resource pool and there are cooldowns which you can min-max. There is a variety of abilities and mechanics like damage over time, debuffs, or dots, other debuffs, resource gainers, resource spenders, stuns, knockbacks, AoE abilities, and auto attacks. I will say it's really cool how Bioware applied the typical RPG archetypes into the universe of Star Wars. There is the ranged spell damage dealer, ranged gun nut, melee classes, etc. For ranged classes in this game, there is an auto-lock like in World of Warcraft, like in a proper MMO. There is an odd problem with the damage, however. The damage seems to occur before my ability has triggered or before the animation for it played. The health pool of the enemy will eat the damage prematurely, it seems. This is such a minor odd quirk, it's almost not even worth mentioning, but it does make the combat slightly disjointed for ranged at least. From what I remember a decade ago playing PvP, the melee and ranged combat needed a balance. The ranged had too easy a time DPSing while the melee players were still trying to get into melee range of the ranged players. There is such an advantage for the ranged players because they also have stuns and knockbacks. The time to kill mobs seems fine at least and getting a kill is satisfying in PvP. Farming mobs in PvE is a possibility for materials and maybe for a few bars of XP, which is perfect. There is no live to win mob farming here, nor should there be though. I think there is dungeon farming if you want it. You could keep queuing for dungeons to rapidly level up, but where's the fun in that since you would end up way far behind in the story? I am over leveled, like I said, for most of the story content due to some XP increase, I assume and it's not necessary. The mobs on the current planet just melt. I don't like being overpowered for the current story content. At least the game scales you down to an appropriate level for the planet you are currently on. I've done every unique, non-repeatable quest I can find on every planet I visit. This includes the main story quests for my class, the main story quests for each planet, and any side quests. I haven't done any repeatable daily or weekly content. I figure I can do those later if I do end up needing XP, or I can even do them at level cap for credits. I'm assuming because of my preferred account status, that may be the reason I'm gaining XP at an increased rate. I am not a subscriber, however, and I haven't paid for anything other than the game. As I've mentioned, I am overleveled and overpowered for all the current story content I am on, so I cannot justify needing even more XP boosts or subscribing for another increase in XP. 
I can't get over the questing and story content in this game though. Occasionally you will receive in-game mail from NPCs you've encountered before. For example, there is one Republic investigator agent that wrote me a threatening letter telling me to watch my step and that my next mistake would end me up in his custody or in jail. I received another in-game letter from a Jedi healer thanking me for saving a fellow Jedi despite him being turned by the Empire. It's details like this that keep you immersed. I should put money in a swear jar every time I use the word immersion or immersive during this review. There's just plenty to sink your curious teeth into in this game. The crazy thing is, there's so much unused space for even more content and more opportunity for storytelling. Again, after, eight, after 11 years, I'm guessing the leveling experience is not improving anytime soon. Sure, there's DLC and expansions, which is good support for any game. The quests and story do a great job of putting your character front and center in conflicts, and the politics of the Republic or Empire. You're not just involved in some peripheral content or some soulless collect and kill-a-thon. The killing X number of baddies objectives are only bonuses and not required. What I like about followers you obtain is they become a large part of the gameplay and story. They can heal, assist, and cooperate with you during combat. They approve or disapprove of certain dialogue choices you make. They can complete crafting quests all by themselves, and they even have their own quests and backstory. The crafting-specific quests are all unique and somewhat quirky. For example, there's an underworld trading quest where your follower is required to investigate whether or not a royal couple is being faithful to each other. It's clear there was a lot of time put into the followers. They are not afterthoughts. LucasArts and Bioware know what the fans want. So, of course, I'm a smuggler with a Wookiee companion. He's a good boy, too. He's the goodest boy. You obviously cannot rename your followers, otherwise I would have named my Wookiee friend Dog Meat. There is fewer emphasis and importance on gear, I find, so far in my playthrough since the rate of gaining XP is so much more rapid and you end up being overleveled for every freaking zone, your gear rarely becomes a focus. It could remain the same for 10 full levels, it feels like. The only upgrades to my gear I found were from vendors, not from mobs, bosses, loot stashes, loot crates, etc. There are modification vendors that sell components that further upgrade your equipped gear, if you do buy gear from a vendor, though, chances are they are already equipped with decent mods. Would you like to know more? I want a quintessential Star Wars experience to consume, especially from a video game, especially from an MMO. I want all my senses to be assaulted with Star Wars essence. Yeah, essence. What the heck am I talking about? I'll tell you. Star Wars The Old Republic offers a unique Star Wars experience in the same familiar galaxy, but a long time ago. Even longer than a long time ago. Like 3,000 years before the events of Episode 4, which was already a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Is Star Wars The Old Republic Knights of the Old Republic 3? It's 300 years later, but yeah, sure it is. It continues the story of a heated conflict between the Empire and Republic. It has the light and dark side choice system, I'm sure a lot of players treat this game like a single player experience anyways, and would say this truly is KOTOR 3. I can guarantee that I will level and play every class's origin story in this game. I desperately want to sink my teeth into every story arc available here. I'll do the daily quests, I'll do the weekly quests eventually. I'll do the annual quests, is there such a thing here? I don't think so. Monthly quests? Whatever. Ultimately, the point being, I want to spend as much time in the Star Wars universe as possible, and Bioware did a decent job of breathing life into their iteration here in Star Wars The Old Republic. If you never played Star Wars Galaxies, you should still check out The Old Republic. If you've only seen one Star Wars movie ever, you should still play Star Wars The Old Republic. If you have a belly button, you should play The Old Republic.